with infinite complacency, people went to and fro of the earth about their little affairs, serene in the assurance of their dominion over this small, binning fragment of solar driftwood, which by chance or design, man has inherited out of the dark mystery of time and space. Let's jump in here. So, Jake, you are not in the United States. You are uh, you are in nope. Britain right now. And we are going to be discussing your grandparents' farmhouse, which you say was located in Wales, correct? And yes. what is, you know, as much background as you can give on this location, you know, how, uh, I mean, it, how long did they have the place? Who built it? Whatever information you can give before we kind of jump in here to these experiences of yours. Yeah, definitely, definitely. So where, where do you start with the farm? Um, originally, it was a blacksmith. It was built as a blacksmith in the 1700s. Um, so it's got like a really long history. And at some point, uh, someone decided to put a chapel next door. And so we literally can step over a fence and we are in a graveyard. It's um, an incredibly old graveyard. Everyone who's ever lived in that area or at least up until sort of like the mid nineteen mid nineteen hundreds is buried in that graveyard. So um, there's a lot of like really localized local people there. And then as it sort of it started off as this sort of little stone cottage um, upstairs was living quarters and downstairs was sort of like the blacksmith shop. And then what is now the kitchen and the in the farmhouse used to be the stables where you'd keep the horses when he was um, sort of shoeing them and and look, maintaining the hooves, I suppose. So over the years, it's been owned by, oh gosh, I, I couldn't tell you how many people have owned it. A fair few. It's changed hands a lot. And my grandparents have owned it for, I believe it's about 20, uh, probably 32 years. It was 29 years last time I asked, and that was a good few years ago. So it's got to be about 32 years they've owned it. And they're still there right now? They are still there now, yes. I still go and see them all the time. Yeah, it's a really nice old, well, I say old house. It's um, it, it's ancient, really, by most standards, I think. Probably not by a lot of the buildings in the UK standards, but by most standards, it's a very, very old house. And it sort of shows its age quite well in the older side of the house um, over the years they've extended it a lot they've um, when they moved in it was still the original original sort of building that was so the um <clears throat> up until sort of the 1980s it hadn't really changed much and then uh, when they bought it they put an extension on so they put um two bedrooms upstairs converted another room um, and then eventually put a fourth bedroom on as well put like a downstairs sort of living room which my nan affectionately refers to as the best room which is where you only get to go to at special times of the year but yeah it's it's like a really it's like a really cool old house it, it's um and you can tell over the years as they've added stuff to it that it's just kind of grown into a really nice family home the best room. I like that. So that's when you get out the fancy dishes, right? And when it's yeah, that's, time that's, for that's, those <laughs> parts of the year. Yeah, that's that's like the Christmas time of year. That, yeah. that sort of time for that room, yeah. When did things start? Uh, at least when, you know, what and what age were you, of course? I want to I want to learn that as well as how early did this <clears throat> this kind of stuff begin um, and what were some of the first things that that you noticed or did anybody talk about anything before you even noticed it? Uh no one ever talked about it I, I spoke with my nan about it quite recently just to find out if she'd ever actually experienced anything and she's the only thing she's ever experienced was she saw the ghost of a black cat 
um, is the only thing she's ever seen. She said she just out of the corner of her eye saw a cat run across the doorway. All the cats on the farm are all farm cats, so none of them are allowed in the house. So Nan went looking for the cat to put it outside again, and she couldn't find anywhere. So she said that's the only time she's ever seen anything in the house. And that was five years ago. But I, I'm 28, and my first ever memory of anything ever happening in the house that I, that was weird, I was probably about five or six. And that was, uh, we used to sort of sleep at Manan's a lot. It was sort of like a big sleepover thing at the weekends. We'd all go, and, like me and my little brother would go and stop at Manan's fairly regularly. And we'd sort of be able to go out on the farm and sort of help out a little bit and just be outside and explore and in a relatively safe environment. But I remember waking up one night and we used to sleep on like this little fold out camp bed. Um, and we used to be in, we'd sort of sleep on the floor next to my nan and granddad's bed. And I, cause I seem to always remember feeling scared in what was our room. Um, so whenever I slept there on my own, when I was at that young age, I never really wanted to stay on my own. <clears throat> so I remember being on the floor in this camp bed next to my grandparents' bed. Something grabbed the end of the sleeping bag and started to um, almost roll it up on me. It was like I was pinned, my feet were pinned to the bed in it. Um, and I just remember waking up and screaming, absolutely screaming. And my nan and granddad both sat bolt upright in the bed and were like, what's wrong, what's wrong? And... I was like, something's got the, something's got the bag, something's got the bag. And, and it was literally just like, it, it just looked like I'd sort of been twisted up in the bag. But I, I can specifically remember feeling the weight of something pushing down on the bag. And so that, that's the first ever memory I've got of something really happening um, that, that couldn't be explained away as just, oh, you've just sort of twisted around in the bag. It was literally like something had full on grabbed it and was trying to pull it off. So that's the first ever memory of something like that happening. And I, I do remember I didn't stop there for a while after that. Um, that, that kind of put me off a little bit of stopping at, the, at my grandparents' house. And um, I, I know that you were very young, but do you remember your grandmother or grandfather saying anything about that incident? No, it wasn't spoken about after that. It was um, sort of like, oh, you're fine. Don't worry. Go back to sleep. Um, so I um, pulled the sleeping bag back into place and, and got back in bed and went to sleep. It wasn't sort of they, they dozed off again. My granddad started snoring again. And <laughs> right. I I just sort of lay there trying to decide whether I was safe or tucked into the sleeping bag or sleeping on top of the sleeping bag. To be honest with you, at that point, I wasn't overly comfortable being in the bag I was really worried that something was going to try and do it again and I'd feel really claustrophobic over it and I just remember being really scared that night and not really sleeping and then I didn't really go back for a long time after that it was it must have been at least two or three months which was really rare because I'd, I'd be there almost every weekend and did um, I mean did did your parents and did your grandparents figure out that's why you didn't want to go back not that I remember no I just I I, they'd ask, do you want to stop and say, oh, no, no, I'll go home. And it took my little brother stopping there with me again for me to actually stop again. Um, but nothing, I don't remember anything else happening after that for a long, long time. It, it, I'm, I mean, it must have been at least another three or four years before anything else I can really think of happened to me again. But it was just that one moment of, oh, that was really scary. I didn't like that. And that really put me off. Um, but once I started stopping there again, no, there was no issues really. Again, it, it was just sort of never spoken of again. But that is just like the first ever thing I remember happening to me. Yeah, I don't blame you for wanting to take a little break there. I don't know why these things find it so damn funny. Well, I guess I do, but uh, because it's very oh, effective. Yeah, but they find it very funny to yeah. screw with people when they're sleeping. Yeah, I think I think when you're sleeping, I think it's probably when you're, you're most vulnerable. Um, it's when... You, Obviously, like they talk about you being in REM sleep and things like that. And I think it's when you're the most susceptible to these things, actually being able to interact with you. I think that's when they can physically get to you the best. I think it's probably why they do it. You're the most relaxed, which is probably when they're like the most capable of actually interacting with you. 
And see, Jake, that's so, yet another reason to want to become a vampire so you never have to sleep. Oh, yeah. Ne never sleep. Don't, <laughs> don't sleep. Sleep's not good. No, that's, that's unhealthy. That is for this Fry sort of those eyes open. <laughs> yeah. So what, what then was the next thing that you can remember happening? The next thing I remember happening was all, all of us kids, there was four of us at the time. So it was me, my brother, and my two cousins. And we all used to, at this point, my grandparents would put bunk beds in one of the bedrooms. So that was like the, the kids' room is what it was called. It was where all the toys were. It was where the beds all were. And we could all be in there and play and be out of the way for a bit when we needed to be out of the way, when we weren't outside playing. And I remember we went to bed when it was quite late. I mean, and um, I remember just sort of being in bed and everyone else, we kind of talked ourselves to sleep every night. We'd sort of laugh and joke and tease each other and just fall asleep. And I remember just sort of being right on the very edge of sleep. I felt all of a sudden the room went very cold and everyone else was asleep. I remember sort of sort of saying, guys, guys, and everyone else was just sound asleep. And um, all of a sudden, my bed sheet was grabbed directly above my stomach, went up in like a teepee and flew off of me. And I sat there frozen to the bed. I, I didn't know what to do, what, whether I should move or whether I should stay still. I, I, I was absolutely in shock is the only way I can describe it. I just remember sitting there going, what the heck was that? And I just remember I'd. I, I was frozen with fear, absolutely terrified at that point in time. That was one of them moments when you sort of go, that wasn't normal. And that was it. And I just I just sort of ro rolled over on the bed. Eventually, after lying there for about five or ten minutes, I rolled over on the bed and looked over at where my bed sheets had landed. And they were like over against the other bunk beds on the opposite side of the room so they'd like properly flown like three or four feet across the room and I sort of crawled out of bed I, I remember just crawling on the floor grabbing the sheets and getting back into bed and pulling them up over me and I held on to them for dear life until I fell asleep again that's the next thing I remember happening and to be able to do that from a, a position where you're completely laying down and to be able to toss them that far it would be a difficult feat uh, yeah, it was um, one of those moments when I was really like, I mean, they weren't, it was summertime, so they weren't heavy sheets. It was, I remember it being sort of, I think, May, end of May, early June, I think, because it was coming into when we'd sort of be getting ready to start sort of preparing to do the hay. And I always remember that being a very busy time of year and we'd all be sort of dragged outside to help do things and get everything ready. So I remember sort of everyone was there for that particular reason. So it was a summertime. It was quite warm in the house. So, yeah, that that's like. So it was very light bed sheets, though, and it was. Um, so I, I don't know how hard it. I, I never sort of tried to chuck them across the room, but I couldn't imagine it had been very easy to get that sort of distance on them. But it was literally just like grabbed in the middle up and thrown across the room and it sort of landed in a crumpled heap over by the other beds yeah that was that's the most scared i think i've ever been in that house i've never been that scared again in that house and so far the theme is coming through pretty strong that uh things were kind of centered around you yeah for some reason i don't know why it always sort of chose me i don't know whether it was none of the others believed it or, or none of the others I don't know. I, I couldn't. I couldn't for life of you tell tell you why it was me. I don't know. I, I, it was just no one else has ever seemed to have been bothered by it other than me. I mean, there are things that uh, people have witnessed happen in rooms with me in them that were that are really weird. But there's nothing that nothing that's ever happened to anyone other than me. So after that, I I did I, I did go to sleep eventually after that, and I did next morning i told my nan what happened and she she sort of said oh the bed sheets must have just sort of slipped off you when you're falling asleep and i was like oh no i was definitely awake and they definitely did and she was oh they, they couldn't have done and sort of later on when i sort of asked her about it 
was when I was a bit old, I just didn't want to scare your cousins or your brother. Um, she was like, but she said nothing like that's ever happened. No. Um, she did say that she'd sometimes get a really funny feeling in the rooms, like the room would all of a sudden go quite cold and she'd feel like something was watching her. But she never actually said she'd seen anything. Uh, my granddad just, no, nope, never seen nothing. Don't believe it. And, and what, about my your, as, what about your parents? I mean, did, did they spend a lot of I, time there and did they ever mention anything? My mum and my uncle, they moved there when they were in their teens Mum sort of said sometimes she feel a bit weird in the house, but she never been uncomfortable, never felt threatened in the house, never seen anything happen other than around me. And my uncle just, he was never, he was, he's one of those really chill, laid back kind of guys. And if something ever did happen, I don't think it'd ever bother him at all. So, no, I, I don't think he ever really figured anything had happened. Um, but I know where he slept in, in sort of his room. It's in like the oldest part of the house. And funnily enough, nothing ever happens there. Hmm. Uh, I've slept in that room many a time and nothing ever happened to me in that room. It's always fine in there. I never felt weird, never felt uncomfortable, never felt afraid. That room so, was always fine. So mostly just the, the parts where your grandparents had put the additions on. Yeah. Hmm. That was where most of the stuff happened, which is what I find, the, which is what I find quite weird about it is it, you think it'd be the old part of the house, but no, it's the new part of the house that this all occurs in. Maybe it's the, the they, whoever they is or it uh, that is there doesn't like the additions. So that's why it was kind of centered around those parts. It it could be. Um or it might just be that it really likes the additions and it decided to stay there. That is true. Um, it, it could be the exact that's... opposite. Yes, it loves the additions. It's like more room yeah. to spread out. Yeah, I can I can explore more. I can go and do more stuff. And well, then I'll just torment this one little kid I was for just going to say, it really was just looking to, to, to torment you and torture you. Yeah. Yeah, he, it definitely did like me. So, yeah, that was like the next big thing I remember. And then after that, little things would sort of happen that I'd never. After that, nothing really phased me much in that house. Um, after that, I could sort of I'd go upstairs on my own and because the house runs on the water heater. So we used to get if Nan wanted hot water, she'd say, oh, Jake, go upstairs and turn on the hot water. So you'd have to go upstairs into like the this part of the house that you know, didn't like me too much and turn on the hot water and sort of go back downstairs. And um, I always remember being absolutely terrified of going up there on my own. And I kind of creep up the stairs and open the door really slowly on the landing. And I'd sort of just sort of look in there and I'd be like, it's, it's, on, it's just there, just, just, just there. Go and I'd creep in, flip the switch and run as fast as I could, slam the door behind me and run down the stairs and they're like what are you running for and i'd sort of say oh it's, it's nothing it's I'd, you know just getting done quick sort of and she always knew why i was doing that thing but she was never too um she never wanted to put much didn't want to give it anything sort of any attention i think was the thing she didn't right. want me to feel more scared in the house i think she just wanted me to be like, it's nothing it's just your imagination kind of thing yeah yeah, I think that's natural so, as parents to do that. Yeah. Yeah, I'd say so. Now, what what are these, you said there was weird things that would happen in rooms that you were in while other people were there. What kinds of things would go on? Um, Just things like, things would fall over on occasion. It, it was just like little things that you could sort of say, oh, that's just a coincidence, like, like a, a cushion would fall off the sofa. But you'd be like, but how did it fall off the sofa? It was leaning against the back of the sofa and now it's on the floor. How'd that happen? Things would move in rooms. You'd be like, I'm sure I left that there. And you'd be like, anyone move this? No, I've not touched it. And you'd be like, I'm sure that was over there. And it, and it would be like complete opposite end of the room on like on on the table or something. You'd be like, that that wasn't there really. Who's moved that? And everyone would be like, I haven't touched it, it wasn't me, it wasn't me. You know, no one would have touched it. And just things like that, you know, little things that you'd be like, what's going on? Why is it doing this? Things that you couldn't prove anyone else hadn't done, but at the same time, everyone denied it through their teeth. 
kind of thing. They were like, nope, was not me. We didn't touch it. You must have left it there. And I'd be like, no, I definitely didn't leave that there. Um, so just that sort of stuff, really. I mean, a, a little bit later on, a lot of things happened that were kind of like, yeah, no, something's definitely going on. But up until that point, it was just little things like that that sort of occurred that you couldn't quite say was anything sinister, but you're definitely like, was, I, that wasn't me. And I definitely didn't put that there or didn't do that. Or So, yeah, that was kind of the thing, the, th- the little things that would sort of really make you, th- things that make you go, hmm, really, I think is the way to put it. And and what about uh, Mr. Fred? When does he come into things? Or, you know, should we talk about, uh, I, you know, the male voices first or? Um, I think I think it's all Fred. Everything that's going on is Fred. And we sort of named him later on after a particular event. Um, it was kind of like a jokey name we gave him. And what, I'll tell what was you about this? That a, yeah, well, minute. yeah, I definitely want to hear this event. Um, yeah, I think I think you will. So what happened with that was my nan, me and my brother, whenever we slept at my nan's, we were always really chatty and, and we'd take the mick out of each other and we'd laugh a lot and mess around when we were supposed to be going to sleep. So we'd sort of be like in the same room, and we'd be sleeping and we'd be laughing and joking and talking and and my nan would get we like, you need to go to sleep now, it's late, go to sleep. And we wouldn't, we'd just keep winding each other up and taking the mick. And so eventually uh, my nan used to do this thing where she'd creep into the bedroom Knowing full well it would freak us out, it pitch black, couldn't see a thing. She'd creep into the room and stand at the end of the bed and look at us. And you could see she was there, but when when you're sort of like quite young, you were like, no, 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 don't like that, don't like that. And we'd try and kick each other out of the bed to turn on the lamps that were next to the bed. We would sort of like be kicking at each other, trying to make the one fall out of the bed to turn the light on. Because it would just really freak us out that she was doing it. And then one night, I was quite a bit older. Um, one night, I remember I was lying in bed. I was sleeping there on my own. I was helping on the farm and I was sleeping in my room. I was probably like 12 or 13 at the time, maybe a little bit older, 14. Um, it was summertime. I was sleeping on the farm, sleeping in, in my own, in the bed and the door opened. I was half asleep, but I remember the door opened and I opened my eyes and looked at the door and I sort of watched the door open. I watched someone walk in and the door closed behind it. And I was like, I just watched them and they walked around the end of the bed. I watched them walk down around the end of the bed around and sit on the bed next to me. It was a double bed at this point. And they lay down and I thought it was my nan coming in to say good night or or something. And I rolled over to say good night and there was no one there. The bed was empty, but there was very clearly an imprint of a body on the bed. Mm. And I looked at it and I just went good night and rolled over and didn't give it any more attention. I was just good night and rolled over and sort of very quickly fell asleep that night. Funnily enough, considered that had happened, but I, I did very quickly fall asleep. And the next morning I got up and I told Nan. And she sort of said, well, no, no one came in your room. I was like, I know no one came in my room, but there was someone in my room. And she said, well, no one came in. And I said, well, it must have been Fred then. And that's how he got his name. And we just sort of named him Fred. I said, it must be Fred. And then I was like, who's Fred? I said, it's the ghost. And then I was like, okay. And that was kind of it. That's how we gave him his name. We just called him Fred. And after that, whenever something weird happened, we go, oh, Fred's up. Fred's around. And that's how he got his name. That's how we called him Fred. It was just to sort of humanize him a little bit. Instead of us feeling like it was this terrifying thing, we thought if we humanize it, it's not as scary. Right. We've taken a bit of the... Um, I've taken something away from it and the fact that this it's this anonymous thing. I've, I've removed that away from it and I've given it a name. Now I've personified it. It doesn't become such a threat. I think was kind of the attitude with that. I, I think at the age of 13 or 14, that was the attitude I took. No, um, and plus it was a funny name. So you know, Fred, right. It, it, yeah, it takes it would take the scare of it to name him something like Fred. He's yeah, cool. It's just Fred. Except Fred's sometimes Fred's he's here. a little bit of an a hole because he's pulling on blankets and the whole thing yeah. with him coming and laying down next to you. And it isn't it amazing though what our brains and bodies can do when it knows that I can't deal with this right now. So I'm just going to turn over and go right to sleep. 
you know, you didn't yes. lay there that night. Like that wasn't an, an, the scariest night of all. And isn't that incredible because he came in and laid right next to you? Yeah, that, that that's the thing is that 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 should have been the most scary experience I had. But at that, but I mean that should be the most scary experience anybody has, really. But to me, that was kind of like that was nothing compared to the bed sheets being ripped off of me and thrown across the room. That experience didn't traumatize me anywhere near as much as the bed sheets did. So at that point, it was kind of like fred up your game a little bit, or, or just give up sort of moment for me really is that I'm not scared that didn't scare me I'm not dealing with this I'm going to sleep and I rolled over and went to sleep and it was just sort of that moment of I'm not going to give it I'm not going to give this to him that's it I'm just going to sleep so I did now um, at this point you're calling him Fred did you yes at this point going forward or maybe before that even before you gave him this name did you ever talk out loud to him say what do you want quit messing with me what are you doing here anything like that no i didn't never out loud anyway maybe in my head once or twice i might have thought to myself what do you what do you want what are you doing but i never actually said anything i think up until that point it had been this frozen with fear response to things going on i couldn't talk couldn't 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 think straight almost every time it happened it was just scream and get help and um, but at that point i was coming to the point of i'm too old to be scared by this now don't give it any power so i didn't um i, I kind of rolled over and just went night and rolled over and went to sleep and that was it and that's that's the first time i ever spoke to it was just when i said night and went to sleep and i don't know if that gave it power or not the fact that I'd acknowledged it and said good night to Fred, <laughs> or whether I took power away from it at that point. I don't know whether acknowledging it would give All it power right. or take it away. But I was I was definitely that that was the first time I ever spoke to it. But it wasn't the last after that. I talked to it more whenever it did something. I'd sort of say, Oh Fred, hi Fred. You know, and I I'd maybe sort of say, Oh, you're back, or something like that to him after that. It was definitely one of those um moments of well i've started this now i've got to carry on kind of things i suppose and just a couple of questions about the property itself that i i'm kind of stuck yeah. on and i don't want to get off of this before i forget i probably would so you said there was uh the the chapel next door right and then you've got the graveyard yes. on the property as well so was this strictly just a chapel where they they'd hold funerals and weddings or was there actually a, a preparatory so, like a room like a morgue almost where they would prep the bodies and things if i'm entirely honest i don't know the chapel, as far as long as I've been alive, that chapel has been lived in. It, it was bought years and years and years ago and turned into a house. I'd love to know if they've got anything going on in there. To be honest, that'd be quite an interesting question yeah. to ask them. Right. But right. Um, for as long as I've known, it's been a house and been lived in. The graveyard itself dates back way to the 1700s. And I know for a fact that almost everybody that's ever lived in in that house is buried in the graveyard next door so that's always been um that that's kind of where i thought fred was from i always thought fred was sort of like the guy who'd lived in the house before um my grandparents owned it um i think was kind of the attitude i took with it but my nan sort of doesn't think or at least when i talk to her about it she doesn't think it's him because she said he was an absolutely lovely old man, as Christian as they could possibly be, and was incredibly nice to everybody. So she wouldn't have thought he'd be deliberately trying to scare a kid at night. So that was, um, so yeah, that was kind of sort of made Fred a little bit scarier, maybe. I mean, the fact but, that um, this property was so old and you have the graveyard where admittedly there were past tenants and owners that lived in the home and then were subsequently buried there. I mean, suffice it to say, I'm sure that people have actually died in the home. I mean, when it was, you know, just the cottage, even that that would have been some things that had gone on. Yeah, I, I think the original the blacksmith who'd owned it when it was originally built, he died there. 
And I know he's buried in the graveyard. I just don't know what his name is to find him in the graveyard. Right. But I know that it, he is there. Um, so I don't know whether it would be him that's there. Maybe I'm not sure. But uh, and then I know that there are at least another five who've lived there and are buried in the graveyard since then. I mean, that is a very um, unique situation that most of us would, I mean, never even have probably the opportunity to buy a property that has such things happening, you know, where you've got this, we're going to live here and then we're, we're going to, I mean, physically probably die in the home, especially back then. They, God knows how far they would have to travel uh, to get to a doctor and things like that. So who knows how many folks would have passed there. And then to have the, the chapel and then the graveyard on the same property, that is uh, that is pretty darn unique. It is. Uh, and when you consider the size of the community the chapel was serving, I mean, it's five houses. Um, would have been like the original number of properties. Wow. There was, I think, only four farms and a cottage in the area. So... Yeah, the, there's when you sort of get a little bit further afield, it, it grows. Mm -hmm. um, I think when you get out to about five miles out from the cotton, from the chapel, you're talking maybe twenty properties at the most. At least, especially in at the time it was all built in the 1700s. Anyway, it, right. it was. Um, I think the chapel was built in 1811, if I remember rightly. That that number really rings a bell. Anyway, but no, it was. Um, it wasn't a massive area, so the graveyard's probably got, I think it might be somewhere in the region of about 70 to 80 graves in it. That, that's more than I was actually uh, I'd, assuming that, that, it was. I might, be, wow. I might be rounding it up a bit there as well. Um, I'd say that's the most that's in it. Right. Um, at the very most. Uh, it, could, it could be close to maybe 50. Um, wow. But I know when you walk in there, it's um, it's not it's not a creepy feeling in the graveyard if that makes sense it, it's quite a a peace feeling when you're in there there's nothing so i mean we used to go in there quite a lot um when we were kids and sort of wander in there and play hide and seek behind the graves you, and things you, you should have just slept in the graveyard then jake and just <laughs> Should have, shouldn't <laughs> left I? Yeah. The house been, maybe maybe would have been felt a bit safer but um <laughs> no it was um yeah, the graveyard was always, we, we did used to play in there a lot. My nan used to take it in there because it was, um, at one point, it was really overgrown when it was first purchased um, by the people that lived in there. Now it was very overgrown. There were a lot of brambles and, and um, things in there. So there was um, blackberry bushes and all sorts. So we used to go in there and pick blackberries and um, and things like that in there and make jams and things. So we, we spent a lot of time in there, um, sort of in the summertime especially, um, and getting on into September when the berries were all ripe, we were in there a lot. Um, and we never once felt scared in there or anything. There was never a threatening presence in there. You know, we'd, we'd wander around for hours in there picking berries and sort of cleaning off some of the graves. Um, uh, especially if we knew that there was someone that was going to visit a family member that was in the graveyard, we'd, we'd sort of go in and sort of like an unspoken rule that we'd just sort of clear off the grave. Um, so they could go and see it. And then um, the graveyard went into trust. And so then it was uh, sort of paid for for it to be maintained by a local gardener who'd go in and sort of cut all the grass and cut all the briars back and sort of maintains it now permanently. So at that point, we sort of stopped going in there and doing anything really. It became less of a um, less of a necessity for us to go in there. Now, what about this male voice? Uh, who who do you think this would have been uh, speaking? And I mean, were you the only one to hear this? I was the only one to hear the voice. Um, it was Christmas. We the whole family were there, so my parents were sleeping in what was the room. Me and my brother used, usually slept in. My brother was sleeping in the next room along from them, uh, which only had a single bed in at that time. And then I was sleeping downstairs while my aunts and my uncle were in the other bed. Oh, no, tell a lie. Sorry, no. My brother was in the room with my two cousins. They were sleeping in the bunk beds and he was on the single bed next to them. And then I, I said that I'd sleep downstairs in what was the best room. 
because uh, it had the comfiest sofas. So I was, it was quite late in the day because it had been Christmas Day. And I was um, sort of, I think it's probably about half 11, 12 o'clock when we went to bed. And I was lying, I sort of snuggled in, into the sofa and wrapped myself up in the blanket that was on the sofa and started to fall asleep. And then I remember, I remember I turned the TV off, got up and put the remotes on top of the TV and turned off the plug next to the TV, which was the instructions I was always given by my, by my nan was make sure you turn the TV off and make sure you put the remotes on the TV so we can find them in the morning. I was like, yeah, okay. So did that as I was told. And I rolled up and went to sleep. And then I don't know what time it happened, um, but I remember an almighty thud on the sofa I was sleeping on. And I woke up, rolled over and said, what was that? A voice just said, go back to sleep. It was very deep as you go back to sleep. And I did <laughs> just rolled over and went back to sleep. And the next morning when I woke up, I, I I remembered this had happened. I I looked up and looked around, and on the floor next to the sofa was the TV remote I'd put on top of the TV the night before. So it, it had thrown either thrown the TV remote at me or picked it up and dropped it by me, and then told me to go to sleep after I woke up to and, see what had happened. And that was the only time that you've ever heard that voice. That was the only time I've ever heard the voice. Aren't those one-offs just so strange sometimes? I mean, just why weird. the why the one time? It is weird. I, I for the longest time I did sort of say to myself I was dreaming. I didn't hear a voice, but then I can't explain the TV remote. If the TV remote hadn't happened and I just woke up and said what was that and I thought I'd heard a voice, I wouldn't have thought anything of it. But the fact right. that the TV remote had ended up right next to me, that was just, that was the weird thing for me. It was like. I definitely didn't leave that there. That was on the TV. So it, that was sort of the moment of that actually happened. What was that? And what about um, the footsteps that you mentioned? Where in the home would you hear these footsteps? Uh, they'd be on the landing above the kitchen. So that would have been the old loft above what would have been the stables is that landing. So... Mm. Uh, one day we were all in the kitchen. Uh, we were having breakfast. I distinctly remember it being breakfast. Uh, my granddad had gone out to start doing something. It was a very sunny day. I remember it being very hot. So he, he'd gone outside. I was in the kitchen with Nan and my mum. And we very distinctly, we knew it was footsteps because whenever someone walked across the land and the lights would rattle on the ceiling. Uh, they, they'd make this very distinct rattle. And we heard someone walk across the sea, across the floor upstairs and the lights rattled. And I was like, who's upstairs? And Nan was like, oh, it must be your granddad. And mum said, no, dad's outside. So I was like, so who's upstairs? And it's like, well, no one. And that was like the time we heard the footsteps on the landing and so and they, they both just them. passed it off i mean they they even saw the lights rattle and you sorry that i was, interrupted you you said you could follow where they were where they were going yeah, above you but we, they were both like ah, it's nothing it wasn't that they were, oh it was nothing it was at this point that i was like oh it's fred and that was when everyone else started calling him fred okay <laughs> fred. um so that must have been fred i got really excited I was like that was fred it must have been fred and my mum was like, who's Fred? And I, t I told her about all these things that had happened to me. And she, she looked at me really weird. Like I was, I'd lost my, lost my mind. And I was like, it's Fred. He's, it must've been Fred. And Nan was like, all right, it was Fred. And that was it. it was, at that point, everyone was like, whenever something weird happened, oh, it's Fred. So um, when I think it's just fascinating that this used to be a little blacksmith shop to begin with, I find that fascinating. So this part of, obviously the horses are, uh, you know, things are, are going on downstairs. He's probably making, you know, horseshoes and doing all this stuff downstairs. I wonder, do you know what would have been upstairs in the loft that he would be doing up there? That work would have been the hayloft. Okay. Uh, I'm assuming the hayloft anyway. Right. 
but that would have been where he kept the feed for the horses, um, I'd imagine, um, or possibly where he kept tools, uh, maybe materials. But yeah, it was it was a very weird layout. Well, I say weird, it probably wasn't weird for the time. Um, but the way the original house was laid out was it was in, it was sort of like an L shape. So we had, uh, there was this big um, stone sort of shed on the side of the house, which is now being turned into uh, a living room. They took it all down and built a living room there instead, like a dining living room. But that was sort of the shed where he kept livestock when he, for food and I suppose uh, sheep and things were in there. Um, and then the kitchen area would have been the stables, um, which was sort of like the little recess around the courtyard. So you had the shed on the, yeah, shed would have been sort of on the right as you were looking at it from the road. Then you'd have had a courtyard where the kit, and then the stables would have been at the back of the courtyard. And then the living quarters were slightly up the hill on the right, but still attached to the stables, which is where the um, smithy would have been. And then the living quarters would have been above the smithy. Well, um, how, how often would this happen that you'd actually hear the footsteps not or i should say not only hear them but these lights would shake because of the, the walking around up there i heard it three times i don't know how how many times everyone else heard them um i heard them three times twice there was someone with me and the third time i was on my own in the house but yeah it was um no one's ever mentioned them other than when i've been around because i'll pick up on them it's like it's an automatic Fred's up Fred's upstairs Fred's who's that up there what what was that where's granddad where's where's so if if there was everyone in the room with me and I heard it I'd point it out or or if there was like someone in the room I'd go where's so and so and they were like outside and they were like right so who's upstairs and uh, it came a point when I'd actually run upstairs to try and see who it was the third time I was like no there's someone upstairs I've got to go and find him I was the only one in the house so I ran up the stairs opened the door on the landing and there was no one there it was just empty um, I looked in all the bedrooms there was no one there I knocked on the door to the bathroom there was no one in there it was just me in the house so at this point I wasn't wasn't scared of him at all he was just kind of like he'd sort of taken on this almost sort of a regular visitor sort of thing and it, it didn't bother me anymore well, at least at that point, he didn't bother me anymore. But no, that was kind of that was kind of like all the things that happened that I know about or I've experienced there. Um, as far as I know, no one else has ever experienced anything. I have asked my cousins a couple of times, and they've they've all they've said a few times. Oh, no, we did feel something weird one once or twice, but we never saw anything or nothing ever happened. So yeah, that that's pretty much like my early experiences with Fred were those. Now, um, Jake, what about when you would go home with your, with your mom and your dad? I mean, did, did it ever follow you? Did anything ever happen at your house? Once or twice, I'd find things in really weird places. Uh, for instance, I remember once I had a, um, it was like the dangerous book for boys or something it was called. And I used to, I loved the book. I was forever reading it. I was always trying to make the things that were in the book. And one day it went missing and I couldn't find it anywhere. And then my mum found it in the airing cupboard. And she came and said, she said, why'd you put it in the airing cupboard? I was like, I didn't put it in the airing cupboard. And she was like, your brother must have hid it from you then. But he swore blind he didn't hide it from me. And at this point, we'd been given, uh, we'd got a PlayStation and he was addicted to the thing and never came off of it. So he was like, I sort of asked him, did you move my book? And he nope, didn't touch it and went back to his game. And I, I believed him because almost from the moment he got up to the moment he went to bed, he'd be glued to the TV screen. Now, something so. that you mentioned in your email, and if this is where you wanted to go next, it is that would be fine. If you wanted to go somewhere else, that's fine too. But you say that you were attacked after coming to faith. Yeah, uh, this is... This is where it all got 
very weird for me. I'd, I'd grown up an atheist. My whole family are atheists. None of them sort of, or my immediate family are atheists, I should say. So my grandparents don't have faith. My parents don't have faith. None of my cousins have faith. So it was very weird. They all find it very weird when I sort of came home one day and said, I'm going to church. But I'd been, I suppose I should sort of start from the first experience with this one. It's it's quite a long story, but it all sort of ties into this event. But I remember I was, I was a, I'm a builder by, uh, I was bricklayer by trade. So I was, um, all, I was at work on this job and I'd realized very quickly that I'd seriously underpriced the job and I was going to lose a lot of money on it. And I was, I was very, I was despondent and unhappy, miserable at work. And I just remember getting in the van before I went home. I sat in the van for a minute and, and people always say that there's no better therapy at the end of a work day than just sitting in the van for a minute. And you just think about your day. And I sat in the van and I just sort of, I, it was a complete joke. And I just said, I don't care who does it, but if one of you gets me through this job, I'll work for you for the rest of my life. And I started the van and started driving home. And in hindsight, knowing what I know now, that was a really stupid thing to say. But I was driving home and it was about an hour and 10 minute drive for me to get home from this job. And I just remember being really, I was frustrated on the way home. And there was this particular stretch of road that was just a very long straight road. And then it was like an S bend at the bottom of the road that went over a humpback bridge and then around another corner. And you couldn't see around the corner. It literally came back on itself and back on itself again in an S. I remember coming down this straight and I all of a sudden started to feel so sick. I, I really thought I was going to throw up. I, I wound the window down in the van. I slowed right down thinking I was going to throw up. And it got to the point when I actually thought, I was going to have to stop and throw up in the hedge. So I slowed down just maybe 10, 15 meters away from this corner and almost stopped. And a motorbike came around the corner, over the bridge, around the corner on my side of the road, properly leaning into the corner, full on sort of racing driver mode, I called it. And he was on my side of the road and he was coming straight at me on my side. It was that moment of we locked eyes. And he had the I've messed up moment. I could see it in his face. And I just I, I couldn't have been going more than like five miles an hour. I just smacked on the brakes, stopped. And he flew past me and missed my wing mirror by inches. I just I sat there for a second and the feeling disappeared completely, completely gone. Wow. I felt absolutely fine and carried on on my way home. Then in the next two days, I finished the job and I went back to the job I'd been working on before I went to this one. I had a house for a really good friend of mine. I'd known him for years um, and he was a very Christian man, very, very Christian man. And I told him the story. I told him exactly what I'd said and what happened. And he went, well, you know what that was, don't you, Jake? And I just laughed and said divine intervention, sort of taking the mick out of him a little bit because he knew I was an atheist and we used to there was this little back and forth we had with each other I mean he, he was a lot older than me he was sort of in his 50s and I was in my early 20s but he was a very good friend and we got on really well together and he just well, he just sort of said well you said it and walked off and I just sat there and I sort of chuckled to myself and I was like, oh yeah that's that I went off into the room I was working in, turned my radio on, had it going almost full blast. And he was way at the other end of the house in his office working away. And it was just niggling at the back of my head that he'd said this to me. I don't know why I did it, but I just looked up at the ceiling and I said, if that was you, give me a sign. Sort of prove it was you that did that the other day. And I went, I stopped and went back to work and not even five minutes later my, my my friend walked in and said jake i just want to give you this just have a read of it and see what you think and he handed me a copy of the king james bible and i just took the bible off him didn't even hesitate looked at the ceiling and said touche he looked at me and sort of grinned and he was like what and i was like 
I just prayed for a sign and you've just given me this. And he just sort of laughed and said, well, there you go. He said, maybe there's more to it than you think. And he could not have heard me because my music was going full blast and I was very quiet when I said it. So I, I just knew he didn't hear me, but he just thought he had to give me this Bible. That was it. That I, Next weekend, I, I read I read the first sort of few chapters of the Bible that night and I went back to work the next day and he sort of said, what do you think? I said, I said, well, can I come to church with you on Sunday? And he said, yeah, of course you can. And that was that. That was sort of my first sort of experience with God, I suppose, is the way to put it. It was a very, very strong coming to faith for me. I remember going home and telling my parents I was going to go to church that Sunday. And they they looked at me like I'd gone absolutely mental. Um, And they were just like, you don't believe in God. And I was like, well, maybe I do. I don't know. And they were like, well, why? So I explained it to them and they were like, it's just a coincidence. And I was like, maybe, but what if it's not? So I went to church and that was that. I, I sort of very quickly gained a strong faith. Absolutely loved everything I was learning. I was really, really strongly into it within the first sort of month. I knew that I was a Christian. I knew I believed in God. I knew that God was there and he was real. I just remember feeling very strong in this faith that I went straight out and I bought a cross um, to wear around my neck. I remember when it came, I had this really flimsy little chain on it. I was like, I'm not wearing it with that. So I sort of took the chain off it and chucked the chain away. And I got a, um, I got some sort of builder's line string and I tied that in a knot and put it around my neck and tied it on. And I was like, it'll never come off. This will never break. And I swore I'd never take it off. And one night I was sleeping at my nan's house. I was fast asleep, having a lovely dream. And all of a sudden, I was wide awake. I couldn't breathe. I was, I felt like I was suffocating. I could feel something had grabbed the string at the back of my cross and was pulling on it as hard as it could. And I was, I was trying to grab hold of it so I could pull it away. In my head, it was like, just pray, just pray, just pray. And I just started praying and praying as hard as I could. I was praying and all of a sudden it just went disappeared gone completely i i just sat there i was like what was that i was terrified again in that house for like the third or fourth time i was actually terrified and i just kept on praying until something in my mind was like you can stop i sat there and i was like what was that and it was like in my head it was just like you're okay. It was testing you or it was it was after you. And that was sort of like the feeling I got of this overpowering. Like I could feel it in the room around me, but it couldn't get to me again. This anger in the room with me. But and you, that was sort of the first time I was attacked. Do you feel like that was Fred? I... I don't know is the answer to that question. I'd like to think it's not, but it it could very well have been Fred. I I just don't know. I mean, I, I never felt threatened when I thought Fred was around before, but all of a sudden the entire thing took like a completely different sort of feeling again. It didn't feel the same at all. It felt very angry at me is the only way I can really explain it. And you said Um, that uh, your entire family were atheists. So I suppose that when you come back into the home and all of a sudden you've you've got this strong uh, faith and and belief in God and, and you're reading the Bible and you've got a cross around your neck now, that really must have put a target on your back from the sounds of it. I think it did. Uh, I really think it did. Yeah, that was that was the moment I realized that it was sort of having a faith 
wasn't just like, oh, I believe in God. Having a faith was, I believe in God, but that means you believe in the devil and the devil is there. You, you can't have one without the other. And that was a very sudden and pretty scary realization for me that all of a sudden I was like, oh, everything's not just going to be like sunshine and rainbows. There's going to be dark days as well. You know, it, it's a very, it's a polarizing feeling, I think is what it was. But I just remember thinking to myself that, okay, if that's what's involved, that's what's involved. And through my life, I'd always wanted I wanted to join the army when I was younger um, and I, I couldn't for medical reasons. I was, I wasn't able to join, but it was sort of like all of a sudden it was just like this light bulb in my head that now you're a soldier of God and you're a soldier of Christ and you're still at war, but it's, it's, um, it's a very different kind of war. And that was sort of like one of the moments when I was like, Oh wow, this is, this is far more serious than I ever thought it was going to be. And um, and what about these shadow figures that you mentioned? They've always sort of been around. Um, I, I see them on occasion just in like the peripheral vision. Um, first time I ever saw one outside of my grandparents' house was when I was at work. I was working in a chip shop. Um, I was uh, just turning 18. This was this was before I came to faith, but I was I remember the toilet was upstairs um, and it was sort of like attached to the flat. There was a chip shop with a bar behind it and then there was a flat upstairs and um, it was sort of like the room before the flat was a sort of like little toilet area for the staff. And I remember going up to the toilet one night and I was I shut the door and locked it behind me. And all of a sudden I heard footsteps walk across the floor. And I was like, hello, I'm in here. Just don't come in. And then they walked back across the floor. And I was like, oh, they've gone back downstairs. And I opened the door when I was done washing my hands and opened the door. And as I looked across the hallway, I just saw like a shoulder and a head disappear behind the doorway. And I was like, I can see you. You're not going to scare me because uh, at this point in time, me and the girl I was working with had this sort of game going where we try and scare each other and see who could get the best scare of the night, basically. So I thought she was just going to try and jump out at me in the dark and scare me. So I was like, I can see you. You're not going to get me. And I walked across the landing really fast to try and catch her. And I knew she'd still be there because I hadn't heard her go down the stairs. And there's no way you'd miss them going down the stairs because the stairs were creaky as anything. And I ran to the top of the stairs and looked down. There's no one there. It was just empty. And I was just, I walked downstairs and I was like, did you just go upstairs to try and get me? And she goes, no, have you seen the queue of people in the shop? I haven't left. And I was like, okay. So it was one of the moments when I was like, so who was that? And that was sort of like one of the things where I was like, okay, so they're not just on the farm. And, and I don't, that, that was the first time I saw a shadow person outside of the farm. And again, centered around you. Yeah, I'm not the only one that's seen that one, though. Um, the girl who worked in the chip shop with me at the time, her and her husband used to live in that flat before they bought a house. And they, she said that they'd see and hear things up there all the time. Um, she said, like, she'd see shadows moving around under the doors when they were, like, in the living room at night. They'd see, like, a shadow walk past at the bottom of the door in the hallway. Um, and it was all centered around the room at the top of the stairs, which is the room that had the toilet in. Um, that room, for some reason, was very active. Um, I don't know why. I, I don't know the history of the building. As far as I know, it was only ever a. Um, it was only ever just like a storeroom. So I don't know what was going on with it. But she said things would they'd hear knocks and footsteps all the time in there, and just see shadows. And it was a, it was a very active area above the above the pub and the um above the chip shop it's always a relief um, when someone else sees or experiences something right it doesn't always have to be at the yeah. same time but even if you find out even years later that it wasn't just you that's a huge relief yeah it is it was a massive relief actually it was one of those things that was, i'm not crazy people do see these 
because sort of like, I'd, I'd never really had much of an interest in ghosts and, until this this actual experience gave me much more of an interest when I was like oh someone else has seen it too um, and that was when I started talking to people that I knew had lived in that flat and I asked them some questions I said did you ever hear anything weird up there or see anything and they'd all say yeah weird stuff happened up there all the time but that was like that was all I'd ever get out and never say anything else just yeah weird stuff happened up there all the time <laughs> you're like that's so enough that- for me that's all I need to know <laughs> Yeah, that was it. I was like, I know I'm not crazy because loads of people, like, I think there's right. like four people I spoke to that, that lived in that flat. And the guy that was living in there when this happened to me, he was the guy who worked the bar. And I went in and asked him when I finished my shift, I went and asked him if he'd ever seen anything. And he was like, oh, he said, he said nothing's ever happened to me, but my son's seen something once or twice. But he's like, I don't spend enough time up there anyway. So he'd literally work in the bar most of the day and most of the night and just go up to sleep and he said that's all i ever do so his his son spent more time in there and saw more stuff than than i did um or than he did um but his son was really quite shy and never really spoke about it spoke to anyone very much actually to be honest so i never really got a chance to talk to him well let's talk of this temper tantrum you mentioned that occurred while the pastor prayed yeah that was the so me and my wife bought a house together when we moved in i was suffering with uh night terrors i'd wake up in the middle of the night in a cold sweat frozen with fear sleep paralysis type thing um and i didn't know what was causing it um and then one night i had this really vivid dream and there was a face directly above my face like almost to the point where noses were touching and um it was screaming let me in let me in let me in just screaming it into my face and i couldn't move i couldn't say anything i couldn't do anything and it, I just stayed silent. Uh, and eventually I just wake up in a cold sweat. Um, every time it happened, it, it was it was almost nightly for weeks on end that I'd have this dream. And uh, the face was really weird. I couldn't. It was sort of like a jet black face with like white, white eyes with really black, big black pupils. It had like the best way I can describe it is sort of like if you've seen like tribal tattoos, like the Maori style tattoos on the face. It's had these white, bright tattoos on its face, just markings. And it, it was uh, I can't even describe the feeling that face gave me. But it was like utter terror. And for weeks and weeks, I sunk into like more and more of like a depressed state and I felt like I was I was worthless like I wasn't doing anything I wasn't getting anywhere I wasn't I wasn't good enough and and I just kept kept sinking into this like almost bottomless pit of despair and all the time I was just feeling like weaker and weaker and not like this face would come after me every night just screaming at me like right above me and one day uh, I could feel myself about to speak back to this face when I was sleeping. And I just said, no. And it stopped. And it, it was it stopped screaming. I mean, I just said, no. Leave. And it, I woke up and it, it was gone and I wasn't sort of frozen with fear. I was I was I could move. I could look around. I could and. And that day when I got home from work, I phoned my pastor and I spoke to him. I told him what was happening. He said, well, can I pray for you now? And I was like, yes, please do. So he did. And he prayed for protection and that this thing couldn't get to us anymore. Couldn't, it couldn't get to me or couldn't get to my wife. And while he was praying, I could feel and hear this presence banging around me like it was stamping its feet and 
and and I it banged on the wall and it scratched at the wall and it I could feel its just like overbearing presence around me and it was full on like it was having like a child in a shop that had been told it couldn't have sweets it was screaming and banging and kicking up a fuss and then all of a sudden it was just bang one bang and it was gone and i felt relief instantly and my pastor Prince finished praying and i was like you are not gonna believe what just happened to me and he was like tell me so i told him and he goes he said you'll be fine don't don't worry you'll be fine now and and so i finished speaking with him and i thanked him and and sort of we said i said a prayer for him and and then we sort of ended the conversation and i just went straight to my wife and told my wife everything that had happened and like it it was like we we prayed together and and sort of sat there like i can't believe this feeling i've got all of a sudden that i'm like i'm weightless almost i feel great i feel i felt optimistic for the first time in months and it was just this really amazing feeling and did the the screaming face go away after that and all the banging and scratching i've never seen it again Mm. but the night after that night after my pastor prayed for me when i went to bed i had this dream that i was walking and there was this like tp of paper and i could hear the voice inside the paper it was really muffled and there's there's someone walking next to me and it's a and the vo- this voice just said really calm and really relaxed just said look it can't even break through the paper and i looked at the paper and on the paper it was the bible and i could just see bible verses and passages written on it and i was just like wow and i, I turned to look at this figure next to me and i woke up and i was just like what was that? And I, I was wide awake and I was just like, oh my gosh, wow. And it was just this overwhelming peace on me. And after that, every night I've read the Bible before I go to bed. I, I read, I'll, I'll read passage from the Bible and I'll, I'll meditate on it every night. And I'm just like, it can't break through the paper. So it was like the, th- at that point, I've read the Bible every night ever since. Uh, I keep the Bible next to the bed. I read it every night. I've never had a problem since. So your story, though, does take a kind of a cool turn here. And I don't know the story, but all I know is that now we're going to be talking. We're going to go away from kind of more the, the haunting type stuff. And you mentioned in your email that you've actually seen strange lights in the sky. Yeah, I have. Again, this was uh, the first time I ever saw him was on the farm. One year, I think I was about 12. I, I really remember this quite vividly. It's one of the memories that really stuck with me from the farm, like a happy memory anyway. But there was a meteor shower. And my nan was like, this is going to be a really good idea. We're going to go sleep on the trampoline tonight. And we're going to watch the stars. Um, so we all took all the sleeping bags and all the bed sheets, took all the duvets and the sleeping bags out of the house. We put them all on the trampoline and five of us lay on the trampoline overnight with all these duvets and blankets on us watching the meteor shower. And it was so cool just to watch these stars shoot across the sky. And then all of a sudden we spotted, I can't remember who saw it first, whether it was my brother or me, but we saw this one light and it was just like really slowly going across the sky. And we pointed out to everyone, look at that one up there. It's going really slow. And we were all watching it. And it was just kind of lazily going across the sky in just like this straight line. And then all of a sudden, it just did like an S in the sky. And we all watched it do it. And we were like, what? And then it stopped and went back on itself and did it again across the sky again. And then it went back and did it again. And then it shot off. And that was sort of one of those moments when we were like, what was that? And it, it was sort of like my nan was like, oh, it must have been an airplane or a helicopter. And I mean, I, I, was, I, I was young, but I wasn't young enough to go, yeah, airplanes do that. It was kind of um, one of those really cool moments when I was like, what was that? 
what did we just see? And um, we couldn't, no one could put a finger on exactly what it was. No one even said spaceship or anything, but that was sort of like really cool thing that we saw in the sky that one night. And just that one night um, for that as well? I saw one other one once with my best friend. We used to work together a lot. And we used to sort of, I'd meet him at about half past five in the morning and we'd go to work in his van. And we pulled up in this lay-by and I was jumping in his van. And we both smoked at the time, so we were both having a cigarette before we went to work. It was like a no-smoking rule in the van. So we were standing outside the van having a cigarette. And I just happened to look up at the sky. And it was like really clear, starry morning. It was quite cold. I remember being able, it was... Um, I think about like only like two or three degrees. I was like, what's that up there? And I pointed to this like light that was kind of swinging in the sky. I think it was, oh, it must be like a satellite or something. And we just watched it for a minute while we were having the smoke. And then all of a sudden it kind of just started traveling across the sky. And it wasn't going fast, but it wasn't going slow. It covered some distance in like five seconds. It was sort of like way over on the horizon, but we could still watch it going. It's just this one white light in the sky going across. And I was like, what kind of satellite was that? And he just looked at me and he goes, mate, I don't know. He said, but I don't think it's from this planet. And we just sort of laughed and got in the van and went to work. And we still talk about that now. Like this was like five or six years ago, but we still talk about it now. Whenever we all get together, we all sort of like laugh about it a bit. And we're like, what was it? We don't know. It was, but it's just like one of those really weird lights we see in the sky every now and then. So, Jake, in, in closing, it's kind of a two-parter question. Do you have anything recently or presently in your home? And when you go to your Nan's house, do you still have interactions via who we're calling Fred? In our house now, it's a little bit odd in our house. Um, every now and then I think I catch a glimpse of something. But it's, it's like fleeting, tiny little glimpse of something on like small and black on the floor. I know our cats and the dog as well regularly stop and look at like the corner of the room. And they'll all do it as well. It's not just like it's one of them. So they'll all be like, what was that? But I, I've got like a running theory that it's a cat or something because I know when we were sort of redoing our garden, we dug up loads of bones and the neighbor said like, oh, she, our neighbor's been here like 18 years or something. She said, um, oh yeah, the woman who lived there before the people you bought the house off used to bury your pets in the garden. So, I mean, well, when we did the garden, I think maybe we just sort of stirred something up maybe. And it's sort of, just sort of every now and then I'll catch a glimpse of it out of the corner of my eye. Well, and it's interesting that uh, you you said that about five years ago, and this is, of course, at your your nan's house, but she saw, the only thing that she ever really saw was possibly the, the black cat, right? That wasn't really there. Yeah, that's a good point, that is. That's a very good point. I never I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. That's, maybe. Maybe Fred's a cat. I don't know about that, but, you know, maybe that's just one of the things uh, going on around you, not only you, but around the, you know, these properties. So especially your Nan's place, what a cool place. Um, but yeah, but what about oh, when you yeah, go awesome. and, and visit your Nan now? I don't know how often you're able to do that as we get older. Well, we, we tend um, to not have as much time for things like that, but do you go home and then have things go down there still or, or to your Nan's? I mean, well, we, we moved about two hours away from my grandparents house so i don't see them anywhere near as much as i should now but when we go back no it doesn't feel the same anymore i don't experience anything there anymore i don't get the feeling that there's something around there anymore um it all feels very safe and very comfortable just like a warm family home really can you pinpoint um, or maybe not pinpoint is the wrong word is there a roundabout age that I mean, have you ever thought about what age things kind of died down there for you? I think it sort of died down around the time I was baptized, which would have been around the age of like twenty-two, mm. I think, mm -hmm. twenty-three. 
something around there. It sort of stopped. It wasn't long before I moved away. I know that. October 2017. So there you go. That was, that was when it stopped. So that was around the time it stopped when I was baptised. And nothing really happened there after that, really. That was when it all sort of stopped. Yeah, that experience of whatever that was grabbing that, that string that you had to cross on, uh, that yeah. sounded pretty terrifying, though. That was very terrifying. Oh, oh, that's a, that reminded me as well. Um, when I was not long after sort of coming to faith, I remember that um, the guy who sort of gave me the Bible, I was really close with him and his wife, and they were a lovely couple. One night I had, um, I had this really sort of calming dream. I was in the, I was sort of in the presence of sort of like this really calming feeling. And I, I just remember hearing this sort of voice. I could hear like murmurs in the background, but I just heard this voice and it was just like, it's okay. She's with me. And I just went, okay, I'm glad. And sort of woke up. Two days later, I got a phone call from my pastor and she said um jake i'm really sorry to tell you but two days ago um my friend's wife passed away and she passed away the night i had that dream and that was like a really i think that's what cemented my faith more than anything was that one dream that was like the most it was one of the hardest things I'd ever had to deal with was losing her because she was such a nice woman. She was, she was so friendly and happy and nothing ever phased her ever. And I, I just thought if anyone was going to go to heaven, it was going to be her. Right. And that was sort of like, that's like the happiest it sounds really weird to say, but it wasn't like a sad feeling. It was a very happy feeling. Like I could feel that it, it, she was safe and she was well. And it was just, uh, and when the pastor rang me and told me, and I was just like, I oh, know. Wow. And she just said, how, how do you know? And I, I told her about this dream and she goes, do you mind if I tell him? And I said, no, tell him, please tell him. And she did. And, and that really helped him deal with it. But it was just that moment of like, don't doubt this. It's real. It was like that moment of, it's all true. Don't doubt. She's with me. She's safe. And don't worry. And uh, that was sort of like the overwhelming feeling I got from it all. It was just that. The, yeah, that is a powerful dream. It was a very powerful dream. It was one of the most... Uh, I think till the day I die, I'm going to, I'm going to remember that. And it's always going to give me that same feeling that, that she was a magical woman and she was an absolutely fantastic woman. Um, well, I and pe I, people don't like to put a whole lot of stock in dreams. And there are times, of course, when it, it there shouldn't be stock put in dreams unless it's a situation like what you just explained. How else what else can you say about that? I mean, that's incredible. I I can't explain it. I can't explain that away in anything other than what it is. And it was, it was just Christ just telling me that she's fine. Don't worry about her. Don't mourn it. Celebrate it. And you know, she's one step closer than we all are. Uh, that is and, that is for sure. We're all going to be there one of these days. So, well, Jake. I, I cannot thank you enough for, first of all, of course, reaching out to me and being willing to come on and, and chat with me about all of your experiences. I thank you so much for that. No, thank you for listening and thank you for giving everyone a bit of a, a bit of a voice in it all. There's, there's not many times you can talk with people that sort of 
have the same sort of mindset and have had the same experiences as you and it's it's nice just to talk to someone impartial well, thanks jake yeah i'm only i'm only one half of uh itf you know you guys are are the other half and i couldn't do it without you so thank you so much well thank you thank you very very much